Hello everybody, welcome to What Would Your Idea World Be? A new podcast which examines many important people and the important things in their lives. What they think about most of the current trends at the moment, what they think about certain subject matters, and of course, what their idea world would be. Ben Harris Quinney is the current chairman of the Bow Group, the oldest conservative think tank in the UK, having been set up in 1951, and he has been in that role since 2011. He's also written for other outlets like the Daily Express and Breitbart London. Thank you for coming on. Well, my pleasure. Mm-hmm. Uh, the first question I wanted to ask you, if you don't mind me using the colloquialism, is what was your red pill moment? What got you into politics and stuff like that? What was your wake up call, pretty much? Well, I, I, I think that I, I was interested in politics for as long as I can remember. And, and what I particularly felt growing up, which was largely under uh, Tony Blair, that, that I really didn't like the the direction he was taking things in. Um, I was was born under under Thatcher, but um, became politically aware, I guess, when when Blair was prime minister. And uh, I didn't like a lot of the things that that were that were going on, and that naively drew me to get involved in the in the Conservative Party in the mid two thousands. Mm-hmm. Um, my subsequent feeling was that the the Conservative Party was, uh, the modern Conservative Party was no different to the sort of things that Tony Blair was was advocating. But but I, I think it was um, the 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 drive to get involved really came from from that feeling that I wanted rid of, of Blair. And uh, what got you involved in the Bow Group specifically? Well, I, I'd been aware of the Bow Group for for a number of years um, prior to my involvement as as being a, a, a small C conservative think tank that had been very significantly involved in the, the birth of the, the Thatcherite movement, if you like, with, with figures like Peter Lilly in the, in the 1970s. And um, I, I started going to a, a few meetings and events. And uh, even though I, I went to university in France or spent a lot of my time at university in France, um, I then uh, went to the London School of Economics after that, which which placed me in London and allowed me to get a lot more involved in the Bow Group. Um, and things then progressed over the next few years. And uh, and after actually quite a quite a rancorous period um, of of political infighting, I uh, I became the, the chairman. And then the the the, the group changed from from being um, uh, an organisation that I think was was more student-led, more short-termist to, to, to one that was more in line with modern think tanks. Mm-hmm. And uh, if I'm not mistaken, you were a councillor for the Conservative Party at one point as well. Uh, what caused your delu- uh, disillusionment with the party uh, in general, if you don't mind me asking? Yeah, I was a, was a councillor in, in Hertfordshire for um, six, 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 seven years. Um, and for most of that period, I was actually a, a member of the, the local Conservative Association rather than the National Conservative Party. In those days, you were able to, to do that. Um, and I think that, that changed um, only a few years ago. And uh, I, I, as I say, I first got involved in the, in the Conservative Party around 2004, 2005. Uh, David Cameron became leader. But when he when he was running for leader and in, in, in the early parts of his leadership of the Conservative Party, uh, whilst he was keen to present um, uh, a slicker image, I think than had, than had gone in the past, his views and and what he was promoting, i.e., multiculturalism has failed, mass immigration um, is the wrong policy for Britain has been far too high. We have a broken society. All of these things spoke to me as a conservative unfortunately as as time went on and eventually he got into government um he became indistinguishable from from blair and the moment it'd been building up for some time but the particular moment for me i think was 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 same-sex marriage when the the debate became so febrile and and nasty um that it you know it became clear to me and i and i think many of others because the conservative party lost a huge number of its members around that time that the the Conservative 
the party had ceased to be conservative small c in any any meaningful way mm -hmm. and th that is always what i what i believe you know I'm, uh, I'm not particularly interested in political parties just for the sake of them I'm, I'm interested in the the ideas and the values and I'm, I'm a conservative so even if a party calls itself the conservative party and becomes a, a, a liberal globalist party I, I don't see any reason for my involvement. Mm -hmm. uh, before I ask the next question one anecdote I found interesting is that uh, everyone, uh, Tucker Carlson's favorite pulse Frank Lunds was apparently very influential in getting David Cameron um, very popular because he put him up on news and stuff like that it's something I read and Weirdly enough, apparently he didn't credit him in his autobiography, which I've got. They were selling like hotcakes. I'm just joking about that at some bookstops. And uh, weird, he doesn't talk about him, even though he pretty much gave him his career on a play. I mean, he mentions David Icke more anyway. Sorry, but that's just uh, revolving into stuff. But um, the next question I want to ask you is that now you look at, say, um, I'm very glad I've had you on today because of the thing that's gone on with Matt Hancock now. And just like, what do you think that represents the fact that he um, has managed to sort of like get away with, you know, being a micromanager of our lives, but at the same time, he, you know, violates his own rules pretty much. What do you think that speaks to about politicians like him? Do you think it speaks, to, and do you think it speaks to the Conservative Party, about the Conservative Party, I should say, rather more broadly? Well, I've, I've come into contact with Matt Hancock quite a few times over the last 10 years, and um he struck me as one of the most intensely obsequious people in politics. You know, he he uh, is someone I think that again under the Blair years he would have been New Labour um, in pursuit of power and position. Um, I'm not sure how you could describe his political views and values, but you can observe how uh, he was a Remainer um, who then under Theresa May became a Brexiteer. Um, then announced that he would never work under a Boris Johnson government uh, and then of course subsequently worked under a Boris Johnson government so uh, you know I, I, there are a, a lot of people unfortunately I think politics is actually dominated by Matt Hancock type people <laughs> people who, who just want to be in office uh, regardless of, uh, of of who is the, the leader or the political party of the day I mean dare I say it, I think these are the sort of people that would be goose stepping up and down Whitehall if the Nazis happen to be in power. <laughs> but um, I think in this case, it's, it's, there's a lot of intrigue to, to this particular issue. Um, you know, Dominic Cummings really focused a lot of his fire in the, uh, in, in, in the select committee hearings on Matt Hancock. Um, and I think that actually made Matt Hancock more difficult to fire from Boris Johnson's point of view, or more difficult to reshuffle from Boris Johnson's point of view. Um, I think the timing is, is quite interesting and the people involved, the journalists involved in putting this story out are interesting with their linkages to number 10. And it, it, it appears to me, purely a theory, but it appears to me that actually Matt Hancock has perhaps outlasted his utility to, to the prime minister and, and to the government. And they're probably quite keen to get rid of him. And in getting rid of him, uh, sort of move uh, the the a lot of the Dominic Cummings accusations and a lot of the concern around the poor handling of the pandemic and PPE contracts and all those sort of things into the past, um, and and to to let Matt Hancock pass with them. Um, so it, it, it seems to me that the the tide in in government or the tide from Number Ten has turned against Matt Hancock, and uh, I suspect that he he won't be long in his position. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, before I get more on to the sort of like the, some of the scams that have been going on with the Conservative Party, I hope you don't mind me going back to something you mentioned earlier. Like, why was it, if you don't mind me asking, the same sex marriage issue that essentially, um, you know, uh, caused you to sort of like get disillusioned with the party, if you don't mind me asking? Was it just because you disagree with it in principle, or do you think the way that the Conservative government handled it, especially people like David Cameron and so on, people like Sarah Willison calling anyone who disagree with her biggest, and this includes people like yeah. David Burroughs, who, you know, a very nice guy, but then again, he used to be one of my, an MP I know, so maybe I'm biased there. It, was it just because of principle, or do you think that you might, or was it, you, it didn't necessarily matter either way, but you thought they'd handle it so badly, it spoke really loudly of their character? Well, it's it's always funny in politics, you know, we, we intervene on the from the Bow Group's point of view, and I do personally on a on a wide range of issues. And 
same-sex marriage is, you know, my, my background is in international relations and economics. Um, so same-sex marriage kind of became a massive issue for me simply because we opposed it and that became a huge story at the time. But, I, you know, I wouldn't have previously listed it even in my top 20 issues that, that I, I thought were important. Um, I think the, the, the culture war, uh, cultural Marxism woke has become very important and increasingly important since. But that being involved in that debate and, and being one of, I mean, the, the, the Bow Group more than myself, but um, being involved in uh, very prominently in the, in the arguments against same-sex marriage, I think was very enlightening for me in that uh, despite what was said by Cameron, it, it, it had become, the, the atmosphere had become in the Conservative Party. And I think, you know, to an extent in, in Westminster, in London society, that you could not oppose same-sex marriage. Um, I used to get invited to loads of BBC events and premieres and all these sorts of things. And suddenly when I opposed same-sex marriage, all of that stopped. And I've also, before or since, never been involved in such a, a vicious and a nasty campaign. I received a huge number of death threats. As you say, it was called a bigot, a homophobe, all, all, of, these, all of these things. Um, and it just struck me that, you know, most of this was coming from within the Conservative Party. And, and you know, in what, in what way is any of this conservative? And uh, a lot of work that we did um, suggests that 30 to 40 percent of Conservative members resigned over, over this issue. Um, I think from the point that David Cameron took over as leader of the Conservative Party to the end of his tenure, uh, the membership of the Conservative Party had reduced to about a fifth of, of what it was. And so it, it, it seemed to me that you had this sort of metropolitan liberal elite that were indiscernible from, from the Blair years, who actually represented a very, very tiny fraction of the population of, of Britain. I don't believe this, this was not a grassroots movement. You know, this was something that came from the top down and, and came from the top down across the West. But um, certainly from, from my experience and perception, the United Kingdom came from the top down, was imposed upon the people by, by, by a very narrow elite. And I think kind of was one of the big things that set the context for the Brexit debate. Um, you know, it was, it was at that point that Nigel Farage really started to gain traction in the polls. And the year after, of course, he won the European elections for the first time. And I think these events, the Conservative Party's adoption of the woke metropolitan agenda very much led to, to Brexit and in that way, you know, maybe it was, it was for the best, but um, it, 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 it was a galvanizing experience, I think. And, and, and also one not where I just decided I didn't want to be involved in the Conservative Party anymore um, in any way, um, but also that I think made me think that, the, 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 you know, the pursuit of a political career was, was folly. There was no point becoming a member of parliament because gone were the days where you could be an independent voice or, or, or similar to a, an American system where you would go proudly to be the most unpopular man in Washington to drain the swamp. It was very clear to me how, how cliquey it all was and, and uh, how very few people stood up for what they believed in and how much power the, the, the central government, you know, number 10 had and uh, I just saw absolutely no point in, in being involved in that because I'm someone that wants to speak my mind, advocate for conservatism um, and not be constrained by uh, anyone else in that process really. And certainly not uh, people of the intellectual capability of David Cameron. Mm -hmm. Give me a second, sorry, I just need to shut the door behind me. I have a little dog who likes wandering around. Give me a second. There we go. Anyway, uh, the next question I wanted to discuss with you is, um, on the whole subject of Matt Hancock and so on, the fact that this um, current government seems so full of like cronies and stuff, whether it be certain other events that have happened in terms of like firing and hiring and whatnot, but then you have people like say Daniel Kaczynski, for instance, who 
got disciplined because he stood around with Victor Orban and Douglas Murray and Desmond Swain got told off. Why do you think that they, you know, these people who pretend to be sort of like holier than now and they, you know, strike out against these, um, you know, people they consider to be troublemakers? Why do you think that they do it to these people as opposed to, say, people who've actually done wrongdoing? Is it just because some, it's just the whole Westminster Metropolitan uh, liberal bubble that you talked about, do you think? Is it just like they will protect their tribe but not political tribes speaking? Uh, or well, it's, it's, it's quite bizarre, isn't it? And we see this um, across the board in the narrative that is put forward in the Conservative Party. The Conservative Party has been in power for the best part of 11 years now. Mm. Um, or 11 years, in fact. Um, and all of these things that have, that have come up, the problems with immigration, um, the, the, the woke agenda, cultural Marxism, these things are all things that have really flourished under the Conservative Party. And they, they can no longer blame the Labour government of old. Um, I, I think when you look at things like cancel culture and you look at things like what is now described as woke, they all came up under the Conservative Party and the Conservative Party founded them. The Conservative Party was the driving force behind a lot of them. As you say, they've, they've been very keen to sort of cast Labour as, as being the ones that are advocating this sort of liberal met metropolitan orthodoxy. Um, but the Conservative Party are, are the biggest adherents to council culture that I've ever encountered. And it so happened that the, the Bow Group convened the conference you spoke of in uh, in in Rome with with Viktor Orban and Daniel Kovtinsky and um, and Douglas Murray and many others, um, the conference chairman was an Orthodox Jew, um, Yoram Hazani, and the accusation put forward the reason why Kovtinsky was was censured, albeit because of a report uh, from a, from a journalist that was very close to Number Ten, um, was that uh, there were accusations that the conference was anti-Semitic, which is utterly bizarre. I mean, you know, the chairman of the conference was an Orthodox Jew, and I don't think there is a leader in Europe that is more pro-Israel than, uh, than, than Viktor Orban or, or the Hungarians. So um, we've, it, it's not even that, uh, that Daniel Kovczynski sort of said, made a bit of an off-colour remark that, uh, that was overzealously responded to. It was all just absolute nonsense and I think if, if you're at that level where as a member of parliament you can't even engage with European leaders by the way that Boris Johnson himself has no problem engaging with. Mm, congratulate um, them on Twitter. Yeah I think I think we've reached a kind of pseudo reality that um, that is that is very sad for our parliamentary democracy because um, Parliament is really there to hold the government to account. And that goes for the whole House, not just the opposition. Um, you know, backbench Conservative MPs are there to hold the government to account. And uh, we saw this, the, the, the crucial nature of this throughout the Brexit process. And I actually think that, um, I, I said this the other day, that uh, after the the debate on lockdown where you had 50 principal conservative MPs come out and, and oppose essentially the government's measures, but it counted for nothing because the government's majority is so high. And I think um, certainly the, the modern conservative party having a large majority is a very bad thing. And I think it was a mistake on the part of, of Nigel Farage to stand down the Brexit party candidates in the election because I, I it's it's unlikely that any of them would have won seats but I think it would have significantly reduced the Conservative Party majority and meant that those few principled voices in Parliament on the Conservative side particularly that are willing to hold the government to account would have had a lot more sway and I think that is a Parliament that is not only um, a better representation of parliamentary democracy but is also a better representation of the public view you know, we had a situation, didn't we, with Brexit, where um, the, the majority of people voted for Brexit, but 75% of Parliament was will remain. Mm. Um, so so uh, the, the Westminster view and the, the Metropolitan Liberal view, I think is totally out of step with, with, with the country. And it is a very sad 
situation that when you have an MP that is brave enough to even slightly challenge that, they are met with the sort of censure that you would expect to see in the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the main reasons I want to bring you on there, because it leads right into the next topic, is uh, the whole thing with Carrie Simmons or Carrie Johnson, as she's now known, because for the last few weeks or months, like, I can't remember how long it is, I'm afraid, um, you, the Boger have been talking very much about how there needs to be inquiry into her involvement in Number 10, her involvement in government. Why did you start um, bring this up and how do you respond to a lot of the criticism that has come your way? A lot of it, admittedly, very puerile, but it's there, I suppose. Yeah, well, um, I mean, in, in the in the first instance, um, I've never actually met Carrie Simmons myself, uh, or, or, or Carrie Johnson, or, or whatever name she's going by. Um, I uh, was involved. It, it was kind of it goes back to what I was talking about the same sex marriage debate and how the all of the environment in Westminster around Conservative campaign HQ CCHQ became very Nixonian, very toxic. And in in 2015, it it sadly led to that that environment, that approach to politics, sadly led led to the to the death of a of a young activist, Elliot Johnson, but also the the ruination, I think, of a great many other lives, um, who who you know um, had their had their careers, livelihoods, or their or their mental health ruined by this sort of bullying, hectoring approach. And, and that is where I personally came into contact with, uh, with, with Carrie Simmons, not, um, not man to man, but, but uh, the awareness of what she was up to and sort of some of the, the question marks and scandals around her and other figures in, in conservative central office, uh, some of which have, have come out into the public domain and some of which have not yet. Um, so what, what, I did and what we did in the Bow Group was really investigate and expose a lot of that in the Tatmatori scandal. And, uh, you know, it led to the resignation of both party chairman at the time and a huge number of, of staff at, at, at CCHQ. And, uh, and rightly so, although I think it, it didn't go nearly far enough, the, the, the investigation and the, um, the pursuit of justice on that end. But, up to the the modern day, um, we were getting increasingly consistent reports from people in and around Number Ten that Simmons was increasingly Simmons as, as she was then um, was increasingly taking a, a really central role in governing the country, which uh, concerned me not just from the point of view that that I knew her. Her, her past modus operandi from her time at CCHQ, and I don't think that sort of thing has any place in politics at all. But it certainly doesn't have a place in politics where you have no democratic mandate and you are, it is impossible to hold you to account because even with CCHQ, um, most of the people there were not democratically elected, but it was possible to hold them to account. It was possible to investigate their activity. Um, and if their activity was, was, was deemed to be inappropriate or wrong or even criminal, um, they, could be, they could be fired and they could be prosecuted for, for that behavior. Whereas if you have someone that has no role um, and is unaccountably running the country, none of that is, is possible. There's, there's no democratic mandate and there's not even the ability to hold it to account. So what happened was when, um, when uh, Oliver Lewis was, was fired from, from Downing Street, my colleague, Nick Connor, who had, who had worked with um, a number of those people, including uh, Carrie at Vote Leave, um, came to me and said that, you know, I, I, I think there's a real problem here with how the country is being run. And I think that has been borne out um, in the time since, you know, a lot has happened since. Um, a lot more stories have come out uh, to, to, to that end, both about the um, staffing of number 10 policy decisions, um, the, the, how several civil servants have, have been uh, bullied or, or moved on for, for not taking the right position on things. Um, and Dominic Cummings, of course, gave his statement to the Select Committee where he said on record that he felt a lot of 
the activity relating to to Carrie Simmons, Carrie Johnson was illegal. Um, so, so not just in breach of the ministerial code or not just outside uh, what our constitution allows, but, but, but actually criminally illegal. So I think that will continue to rumble on as a debate. And I think the only appropriate way to solve it is, is to have an independent inquiry into it. Mm -hmm. And uh, one quick anecdote about her is that one of the weird things that she does, I've noticed, is some of the people that she picks for advisors or like that she's, you know, brought in, like that Nim Carelli person who in her tweets, I swear she's been nasty about Brexiteers. And there's one tweet I specifically remember where she wished Donald Trump was a period or something, you know, that sort of unhinged stuff. But these are the sort of the people that she's allowing. I just find that rather strange. But uh, do you think there would there's a double standard with all that? Sort of, actually, the thing I wanted to ask was that. Um, do you think that she's the reason that Boris Johnson has, you know, done a lot of this sort of like woke stuff, this cultural revolutionary stuff? Or do you think he just sticks his finger where essentially you know, he's one of these politicians who stands for nothing and therefore falls for anything? Um, I certainly don't think there's any benefit to Boris Johnson politically in, in making statements at the G7, like we need to build back gender neutral and more feminine for that matter. Um, I, I think not only does that make him look stupid, it uh, is also entirely out of sync where, where I think that the, the country is. As I say, when we had those by-elections in May and, and Labour had those terrible results, um, certainly a lot of a lot of MPs and a lot of Conservative Party allies in the press were very keen to make the point that Labour got this result because they'd they'd lost the ear of ordinary people and their concerns about um, everyday things and started talking about trans issues and BLM and all of this woke stuff that, that I, I think is supported by a tiny, tiny fraction of the, of the population. So I don't see that, oh, Boris is thinking, hmm, there's some votes to be won here because I think there are only votes to be lost uh, in, in that. And particularly when you um, make sort of half cock speeches like the one at the G7 that you don't even really make any coherent sense at all. Um, my suspicion is yes, that, that, that all of this stuff and the green stuff is coming very significantly from uh, Carrie and her acolytes. And, you know, the, the main problem with that is that no one voted for this. Uh, I don't think the country wants it. I, I, I think when the economic fallout from coronavirus really starts to hit home and the cost reality of a lot of the, um, the, the so-called green measures that are, that are being brought in, uh, start to hit people in their pockets and, and in their communities. I think we'll see something similar to the to the to the Gilets Jaunes movement um, and and uh, a real feeling in the public that um, this is not this is not what we want mm -hmm. and this is not what we voted for. Um, you know, pe people voted for Brexit and for Boris Johnson. I think for a return to conservatism and nationhood and patriotism and common sense uh, in a lot of ways. And uh, I think if they don't get that, then you'll see uh, Boris Johnson's popularity plummet. And uh, one thing I want to ask you from that is that, do you think uh, sort of like the fallout electorally will come sooner rather than later? Because we've seen so far, I can't remember which seat it was, um, the, the, where the Liberal Democrats took a seat from that the Conservative have held for ages. Yeah. Yeah, 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 that one. And of course, yeah, sorry. And also the upcoming by-election in Bentley and Spen where that you know, with all the stuff of Matt Hancock going on, and also the fact that the candidate there, he might be a nice guy. I don't know him personally, but he doesn't seem to be interesting to well. I say the stuff that's going on there with some of the cultural issues, like for example, the whole grammar school thing that's gone on there with that teacher in hiding. He seems to be very reluctant to talk about that. Do you think if the you know, do you think if they just stick to sort of being Blairite light, I suppose, if you uh, with a bit more free market economics on the side, that they're gonna start, they might have some red wall voters for now, but they're going to lose a lot of their traditional and middle middle England base, perhaps. Well, look, I, I think if you want to boil it down, there's one reason why the Conservative Party is where it is in the polls, and that's Brexit. Um, the, 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 this Conservative Party establishment, um, and, and this is where I things really started getting nasty in, in 2015 between myself and the Bow Group and the Conservative Party is when we back Brexit. 
um, and when we started pushing for Brexit, because the entire Conservative Party establishment, the cabinet, the prime minister, of course, was pro-Remain. The Conservative Party, you know, in that in that vein, was a was a Remain party, as of course was Labour. But the difference is that the Conservative Party, I think, recognised, uh, although not particularly quickly either, but eventually recognised um, that they had to embrace Brexit, and they did. Um, and the combination of that. Uh, and, and Nigel Farage leaving the field, I think allowed them to go sort of 10, 15 points ahead in the polls. But but I think that's pretty much exactly the 10 or 15% that used to be voting for UKIP or the Brexit party. Um, and I said all along, regardless of views and values, you know, since 2010, Cameron's strategy was, was, was third way centrism to, to try and put himself in the center and win over votes from Labour and the Liberal Democrats. It never delivered. Um, you know, the, the best he, he got was a was a very anemic majority. Obviously, he had to govern for, for most of his time in office in coalition. And Theresa May, the same, um, you know, confidence and supply agreement with, with, uh, with the DUP. Um, as soon as the Conservative Party embraced nationhood and wrapped themselves in the colours of Brexit, they won uh, 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 the largest majority that they've won since Thatcher. Um, and I think because that's the, the people want the Conservative Party to be conservative, to be patriotic, and to be all those things. And when they are, um, they get a very good result. So my sense is, the, the, as I say, the economic fallout from coronavirus will be massive, something similar to 2008, you know, where we're sort of um, immediately after the the events have occurred but the events have not yet filtered through society and the, and the ripples of those events haven't reached people i think when that does happen there'll be a big political realignment as there was after 2008 which was a, a root cause of, of things like brexit and trump i mean it's impossible to predict exactly what that will mean except i think you can with confidence say that the results will be very significant, i.e. it will lead to very significant change. Um, my sense is the more people realise that the Conservative Party is still not Conservative small c, um, and, and once other figures have a chance to move in and fill the shoes of Nigel Farage, you'll see uh, uh, an additional party start rising up in the polls and you know, the Conservative Party will lose that 10-15% of the, of the vote, which I think will will rebalance things and will um, bring bring Labour into um, into closer proximity poll-wise with the Conservative Party, not because Labour are any good or because uh, I think the public identify with their views, but 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 just because it will it will pull the Conservative Party's support away. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing I want to ask you on that is like, why do you think? But they're so still pretty much wrapped up a lot of the Conservative Party elite and so on in Blairism, even though it's been through several elections and several movements, been repudiated several times, where it'd be, you know, David Cameron losing the EU referendum result or Theresa May getting absolutely hammered during her time in office, or again, as you noted, the rise of Nigel Farage. Why do you think that they are still so tied up to Blairism? Is it just because they feel that's the only way they can win, or is it because they actually believe in that sort of stuff because it makes them feel better off? Well, look, I mean, I don't want to sound like too much of a conspiracy theorist, but I think you can look certainly across the West and see the same view, um, you know, and even when you you elect someone like Donald Trump in the United States, there is a strong argument to say that over the Trump years, the progressive agenda still advanced, despite the fact that, you know, Trump was seen as being a an extremist against it. <laughs> and... I think, you know, there is such a thing as the establishment, or if you want to go more into the realms of the conspiracy arena, the deep state. And it's very hard. It's very easy to find a member of the public that uh, is sceptical and in disagreement with metropolitan liberal globalism. In, in fact, it's very hard not to find a member of the public um, that, that is of that view. Um, but it's very hard to find someone in Westminster who who opposes this stuff. And um, I think you you know you can sit with a with, with a Brexit vote, as I said, 
the majority of the country voted for Brexit, 75% of Parliament were against. Um, there is a House view, there is an establishment view. Um, it's still very much there. If you put a gun to their head, you know, they will accept that they've got to do things like Brexit, but they will try their best to deliver it in name only. And I think it's extraordinary. Some of the things you've you've seen come out since. I remember a piece by James Forsyth, who happens to be the husband of a of a key number 10 aide in Allegra Stratton, um, who said that Brexit was a vote for more immigration, not less. <laughs> and, uh, but, but, you know, Brexit happened because we actually want more of the green uh, ideology. We want more mass immigration. We want more globalism, uh, which is, of course, absolute nonsense. But um, that is the way the establishment, I think, is coping with Brexit by by saying that it's actually a vote for um, moving more more quickly than the EU in the direction of progressive liberal globalism. Mm -hmm. um, so so uh, you know you 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 couldn't you couldn't make it up, but um, that is the brazen nature of the establishment. They they if they can't win, they will just um, make your victory into their own eventually. And uh, on that, do you think, hypothetically, like, um, if the Conservative Party were actually sort of hypothetically embrace conservatism again, what, how do you think what they need to do is essentially is perhaps just go back as far as, say, 2001 or sort of like the early 2000s, where, to their credit, I don't want to say they were, you know, amazing what they did, but uh, William Hague and Ian Douglas were at least trying to put the party in a sort of state opposition towards Blair. Do you think they need to go back to that or... What would you like if you know for the Conservative Party to actually embrace sort of being right wing again? What sort of person would have to come in charge, or do you think it's beyond the pale at this point? Well, if you look at the leaders that have come into power that have challenged the establishment over the last hundred years um, in in Britain, in the United States, and in the West, you can count them pretty much on one hand. Um, you know, Thatcher was was one such figure. Um, uh, you know, I think uh, Trump is one such figure. JFK was one such figure. Um, but it, it is it is a rare thing indeed to find someone of that clarity of mind and that bravery that they're willing to take on the establishment and are able to win. You know, our, our generation's version of that would be Nigel Farage who despite having huge public support and um obviously you know being, being i would say the if you had to pick one individual that was the driving force behind brexit i would pick nigel farage mm. so someone that has huge support um has achieved momentous things in the arena of politics but um you know pretty much has no chance of ever getting into parliament and never did um to, to the idea of a figure that could get into parliament and not only get into parliament, but could get into government on that basis, I think is unfortunately far-fetched because you know, we, we, we have at best the illusion of a democracy. I think in, in Britain, you know, we, we, we have a system where unlike the US primary system, the central parties decide who the candidates are gonna be. So, you, know, you can't make a primary challenge against a candidate. CCHQ will, des will decide who's approved and who isn't. And uh, you know, maybe the local association will get a choice of a shortlist of three or something like that, but basically they'll all be the same. Um, and so, so you, you, know, you, you, you get a, a big filter on who gets into parliament or who can even stand for parliament, who has a realistic chance of winning. And then you also get a big filter with the first past the post system uh, in terms of an insurgent party, a new party, getting to the point where they can realistically challenge even for parliament, even to get you know, a couple of MPs elected, let alone to challenge for government. And yet these parties like UKIP and the Brexit party um, can demonstrate huge public support um, and, and can demonstrate successful campaigns like Brexit. Uh, but um, you know, don't don't really have a realistic chance of getting into parliament or representing the people. And for context, I think under a proportional representation system, 
the 2015 general election, I think would have seen approximately 90 UKIP MPs elected to parliament, whereas uh, they actually returned two. One, it was uh, Douglas Carswell. Yeah, one who was a former, but well, but it, I, yeah, I couldn't remember if Reckless or Carswell had both been returned, but certainly uh, Carswell and, and yeah, he was just, he was a, he was a former Tory mm. MP. Um, so you can see the difference there that, that, you know, if we did have a PR system and UKIP had returned 90 MPs in 2015 to represent their breadth of support across the country, you could see under that system how that momentum could have been built to the point that over the, over the last uh, five or six years, UKIP could now be in a position where they could genuinely be challenging for government. Mm. Um, so that's the that's the scale of the difference it makes, and I think um, I think it is incredibly difficult. You know, even if you have the, the the talents and the charisma and the communication skills of a Nigel Farage, you don't really stand a chance. So, other than the second coming of Christ, I'm not sure who could who could break that system. Um, but what I do think it is meant is that which is a failure in itself of parliamentary democracy. But what I do think it is meant in Britain is that the, the, the power lies increasingly outside of the walls of parliament. Um, it, it, it lies in figures that may not stand a hope of, of being elected under the first past the post system or, or under the, or getting selected um, from, from the, the party centralities, but are able to influence and, and change the conversation. And, you know, I've seen that in a small way in the Bow Group, that a lot of the things we've been talking about for a very long time, like Brexit, which Bill Cash, so Bill Cash accredits to beginning in the Bow Group, um, like the stand against cultural Marxism and, and, you know, taking a woke. These are all things we've been talking about for a decade or more, certainly more in the case of Brexit, against the will of the Westminster establishment and yet we have managed to win the argument on I think a number of those fronts and will win more arguments yet and there are many larger organizations and, and more prominent figures than the Bow Group that I think are willing to take a stand um, against the sort of liberal Westminster orthodoxy um, and I think whilst as I say they they probably don't have a chance of getting to parliament they do have a, a great chance of affecting conversation and the debate in the country and they do still have a chance of winning the argument. I hope we can have um, real political reform in Britain that puts the people back in charge but until that time I think we've still got to keep fighting from the pundits we from the from the pulpits we have um, and uh, and because of the intellectual caliber of a lot of people in parliament like the Matt Hancocks of the world I think we have a real chance. And uh, on that, um, do you think essentially getting rid of the first past the post and replacing it with BR would be a better, you probably already answered the question in the last bit, but just the way you're making it sound. Uh, so do you think it would be better? Because if you look at, say, like Germany, for example, like the AFD there can at least win, I can't remember how many seats it was, but they won a good chunk, at least enough to hold Merkel's feet to the fire on the immigration issue. If you look at New Zealand, there are people who, you know, can oppose sort of like some of the stuff that, their Prime Minister Arden can do. So do you think that's what we need, like a form of PR in Britain, in terms of like national elections at least, to get a lot sort of a better yeah. view of what um, people would actually want or get a better representation rather? Well, I think the age of deference is over. You know, you, you can't have an age of deference in the internet and social media age. Um, I think people want to be more directly in charge of the decisions that are being made. I think people want to have a much greater role you know the average citizen wants to have a much greater role in the direction the country is run rather than deferring to uh, an aristocracy or a neo-aristocracy and I think the British system is one that needs root and branch reform at this point you know we are a parent of democracy in the world um, but our form of democracy I think is frankly out of date you know you've got institutions like the House of Lords which uh, make absolutely no sense in the current form. They're just a, a, a monument to cronyism um, and, you know, people being rewarded with 
decision making capabilities in our national democracy on the basis of how much money they've donated to political parties it's just an absolute farce and outrage um it is now i think the largest um democratic chamber on earth because of the sheer number of people that have been funneled into it due to cronyism so i think that's got to go um and the systems i like as i say are systems like the us where you you have a you have a primary system so you know conceivably anyone can go before the public and, and win the nomination um and and represent the public um but i think that we can actually do better than that and if you look at countries like switzerland that um have much greater emphasis on direct democracy and and referenda i think that is inevitably the future um i, I think direct demo democracy is inevitably the future and you know there are a lot of people that say well the problem with having a, a non first past the post system that, that may in include a pr component similar to what they have in you know, germany or spain uh is that you it, it makes it almost impossible to have majority government but i think that's no bad thing because all that has happened is that the as, as nigel farage put it succinctly you know you have a lib lab com um you have different parties that could conceivably get into majority government but actually they're basically all the same all the same people um often went to the same schools and um, universities you know, the same university is a ludicrous situation in Britain where um you know two out of the three uh most recent prime ministers not only uh, went to the same school and university but were members of the same 12 man dining club and most of the rest of the members of that 12 man dining club were also cabinet ministers uh, in some <laughs> cases were senior cabinet ministers uh, in the case of George Osborne so um you know that's not a proper democracy this is a, this is a country of 65 million people in in 2021 um you can't have a situation where where a tiny tiny narrow elite is ruling over and governing that many people with with very little accountability and very little potential for challenge um and whilst i think you, you know you can envisage many dystopian futures sort of 1984 uh, type scenarios my sense is that ultimately you know the power of the people wins and the, the people want to be in charge of their own destiny and so in that sense i see reform and change as inevitable um and i think having a pr component would probably be a good part of that in a parliament that is more representative of the people even if it means that there can't be clear majority government that, that you know there are a lot of voices that are heard in the parliamentary forum that are currently not being heard mm -hmm. and uh, one other thing i want to ask you you talked about uh, thatcher earlier uh how do you feel that sort of like the liberal and left wing sort of wings of the conservative party or sorry culturally left wing have sort of like adopted her as a sort of symbol in a way like how uh, how do you yeah. feel about this actually because um you know they sort of like take taking the free market economic stuff but sort of ignore the fact that at least culturally she was very much a you know social conservative very christian and so on how do you feel that they yeah. essentially have taken yeah one bit and sort of dumped the other it's one it's one of the things that makes me most angry in fact you know you've got organizations like the center for policy studies who claim to be um the foundry of thatcherism um and are promoting uh, you know the, the the trans ideology and just a sort of open borders do what thou wilt globalism um the most important thing to margaret thatcher was her faith uh you know th th that was number one for her and um i i had the, the the privilege to spend some time with margaret thatcher my my, my grandmother had the same privilege when she was alive and a, a lot of the people involved in the bow group uh, had the privilege to spend uh, you know almost every day of her government with with margaret thatcher and um the the reality of margaret thatcher of what she was you know i would describe her as essentially a, a christian nationalist um she was fiercely pro faith and fiercely patriotic and nationalistic 
um, as someone described, you know, almost to the point of, of, of xenophobia, uh, you know, certainly in her view of uh, some of our European partners. Um, and so the way that that has been bastardized and, and changed to, to turn her into, you know, just another advocate for globalist liberalism, I think is an outrage. I mean, she, she herself said that one of her greatest regrets was having implemented economic Thatcherism, but not cultural Thatcherism. And I think that was, you know, I, 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 I'm not someone who is entirely hagiographic about Thatcher or, you know, thinks that she could do no wrong. Um, I think one of the flaws that she had was that she, she thought she would go on for a lot longer because, you know, she thought she was unimpeachable, un unchallengeable. And so unlike Ronald Reagan, she didn't have a, a, a sort of fixed idea that, you know, I've, I've got eight years to enact my project. And so I need to uh, focus on all aspects of my vision for the country. I think she, she thought she had a, a lot more time. And so she felt she needed to address the economic problems first and talk less perhaps about the, about the cultural and the, and the social side, uh, despite the fact that she was a very strong uh, social conservative and you know her faith was very important to her. Um, but I think the ultimate result of that has been that the right briefly won the economic argument, um, but lost the social and cultural argument. And the ultimate result of that will be that the economic argument will also be lost because you are seeing now, I think, figures rising to prominence. You know, I, I the idea that that Corbynism is over, I think is, is very false and it's being proven false by, by Keir Starmer. Um, I think the future of the left looks a lot more like Jeremy Corbyn. Um, I think you can see it in the United States as well with figures like Ocasio Cortez. You know, Marxism is back and um, it, it came back because of cultural Marxism. Um, it came back because of the extent of the left's victory on the on the cultural and social front. And now the figures that gain prominence in that cause are using it to advocate for full Marxism. I mean, it's called Marxism for a reason. The, the end goal is Marxism. It's Marxism by other means. And so I think even if you are someone who is just a, a do what thou wilt libertarian um, who, who, who thinks that, uh, you know, we should just be individuals in a, in a globalist system and have no borders or anything like that, uh, but believes in the notion of a free market and free trade, I think those people will be very quickly disabused of that position because they have failed to stand up for the pillars of society that made Britain great and allowed us to have these structures where we could be largely free. You know, I think if you if you strip all that away, you'll very quickly find that you you lose the economic liberty as well. And, you know, Peter Hitchens has spoken very very powerfully on this, um, and uh, I, I, I think as well it was quite indicative what what Richard Dawkins said. You know, probably the most famous atheist on earth, mm. who uh, in the latter years of his career said, "Oh dear, we might actually seriously regret uh, getting rid of Christianity." because uh, whilst I don't believe in it, um, it actually presented a societal structure that allowed us to be largely free and, and at liberty. And if you remove that, if you remove one of those key pillars, um, there is a very good chance that what comes in is actually something far worse. And uh, one of the other things I want to ask you, talk about economics and stuff like that. Uh, one of the other things that the Bogue Group has campaigned for in more recent times is the uh, fr free trade deal that um, the UK is, uh, I, th I think it's been completed, if I'm not mistaken, with Australia. And I think the Bar Group, if I'm not mistaken, had some objections to it. What were those objections? And uh, what, um, yeah, essentially, what were the objections, pretty much? Well, this essentially goes to the difference between conservatism and neoliberalism. Um, the two have been conflated for a very long time for, for many of the reasons we've just discussed. And conservatism. Is, is essentially a belief in, in nationhood that, um, that 
the charge of the government of your nation is to uh, promote the views, values and interests of, of citizens of that nation. When you get things like the Australia trade deal, what they are really doing is opening up the UK market uh, to other global markets that are able to produce goods far more cheaply than we can in, in the UK. So it, it, it may see an increase, uh, and it will be a very minor one, but it may see an increase in GDP, but it's also likely to very significantly damage Britain's agriculture in industry. And, you know, controversially, I am a protectionist. I believe that we need to stand up for uh, our, our domestic industries. And again, we have in Britain, I think one of the most vulnerable structures to global recessions and global events of any nation in the world. Um, so it's, it's all good as long as money is flowing through the city of London, but that could stop very quickly. And we could very quickly have a situation where our economy is, is in meltdown. Um, it is dangerously imbalanced towards the service sector and towards particularly financial services in terms of, um, you know, if, you, if you're talking about the contrib contribution to GDP. Um, and, you know, despite the Conservatives coming in 2010 saying their number one objective was to get the debt under control, they have nearly tripled the national debt. We are in a position now um, that is roughly the same as where Greece was going into the 08 financial crisis. And um, there is a, a huge risk I think of inflation and a debt crisis and a huge risk of global instability off the back of coronavirus that means that and we saw it a bit during coronavirus you know where certain countries were starting to say oh, we're not going to export this th th these vaccines of course because we want them we want to use them domestically we're not going to export this PPE equipment because we want to use them domestically we're not going to export this food because we, we want to use it domestically and uh, there is a very conceivable scenario. We, we did a major paper last year on Britain's agricultural sector. There is a very conceivable scenario where um, we are left in a position where we cannot feed the, the, the population of the United Kingdom in a crisis. And, you know, that's just one small part um, or, or one small aspect of what could seriously go wrong when you have a very imbalanced economy. And you look across... Um, you look across the channel, much as I'm not a Francophile, but I think if you look at countries like France and Germany, their economies are a lot more balanced, a lot more stable, and, and therefore a lot more resilient to, to, to crisis and, and recession and, and disruption. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, on, uh, the last anecdote of this, um, I'm protectionist as well, by the way. So you, there's no controversy on this show about that point of view from being. Well, I would, I would, I would very briefly say on that. You know, we we hear a lot of talk about the free market. I don't think a free market ever existed. I mean, I I I think it's a very good free enterprise. I think is a very good thing. Um, but basically, the choice now is between corporatism um, as an arbiter or or the state as an arbiter, mm -hmm. because. You know, if you wanted to set up, for example, a small coffee shop in the high street, um, you are at an immediate disadvantage because Starbucks down the road doesn't pay any tax uh, and you'll be expected to pay all sorts of taxes. Um, and also, you, the, you know, you, the, the sheer scale that companies like Starbucks and Amazon operate on in terms of their, their, their buying power and their economies of scale, um, you put, will, put, will put anyone out of business. Um, so. I think if one is not protectionist in the, in the modern economy, what you do, you do not facilitate a free market, you facilitate a corporate takeover. And we're already more or less at the point where sort of six or seven massive companies produce almost everything we consume. And I think that will probably continue to reduce as more takeovers and mergers occur. And so you've basically got a situation that's no different to communism. You know, you've got sort of, I, I before Christmas, I was buying some, to buy a projector and uh, it's basically now only one high street uh, purveyor of electrical goods it might as well be called the, the people's electronics depository <laughs> um yeah that's 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 not that's not free market free enterprise competition but mm. um 
that, that I think is the ideal. So uh, I, I reject the notion that a, that a free market exists um, and I very strongly oppose corporatism. And the only way to do that is to be protectionist. Mm -hmm. Terrace work. Anyway, uh, one of the last questions I want to ask you is that um, another thing that you and a uh, colleague of yours, of, of colleague of yours, sorry, of the Bow Group, Rahim Kassam, uh, has talked about in the past is you've criticised GB News specifically, this new channel that started up that's meant to be the British equivalent of Fox News or whatever. Uh, having you know, having it come out now, uh, what do you think of it? And uh, do you, was it as bad as you expected it to be? Um, I mean, it, it, in terms of quality, it was, I ne I've never quite seen anything like it. I mean, it was a lot worse than I expected to be, it to be on that basis. Um, but that's not necessarily, you know, a major problem in the sense that if, if you've got an operation that runs over a number of years, hopefully you can sort of look less like a student TV channel. No offense to you, but uh, <laughs> less like a student TV channel. Uh, by the end of it, but um, I think the, re the the real problem with it is the same as the problem with the Conservative Party, in that I know a lot of people, in fact, perhaps the majority of people who vote Conservative Big C and are activists for the Conservative Party will, when press say, "Yeah, look, I know," and I'm talking about a lot of Conservative members of Parliament, a lot of Cabinet ministers will say, "Look, yeah, I know the Conservative Party is not great, but it's better than the alternative, isn't it?" Um, and I think we've we've got into a situation where that is sort of the offer. So so you look at GB News, and I think Nigel Farage is doing something with them now. Um, he did one like show, if I'm not mistaken. I'm not sure yeah, if it's a full time he's, thing. He's been on it, but I think if you if you look at the vast majority of people involved in GB News, you know Andrew Neil is here to take on woke and the establishment. Your favourite. You were quite yeah the the guy who. Um, in my case, was a was an agent of David Cameron and CCHQ to try and discredit me for for calling for uh, a Brexit majority in Parliament. But um, more generally, you know, spent his whole career at the BBC and uh, didn't seem to have a lot to say about the problems at the BBC when he was employed by them. Um, but when they fired him, uh, he suddenly became deeply concerned uh, about the license fee and about the woke agenda. And um, Andrew Neil, I actually think. Is sort of the best of them in terms of, I, I mean, I, I think the guys are um, uh, not someone you can pin down in terms of his political views. You can look at his past experience of the BBC, The Economist, um, uh, The Times, and sort of see a very establishment past. But but Andrew Neil is, uh, I, I don't think many of you would deny, is a, is a sharp guy. Um, a lot of the other people involved in GB News just seem to be uh, ones for hire. You know, they, they, they sort of involved in establishment media before and have maybe lost their way a bit in their careers or uh, lost their jobs and have, have seen an opportunity there. And you know, if you if it, it's it's backed by the Discovery Group, which I think is about to be taken over by the group that owns CNN. Um, you, I, I think you'll 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 see whilst their their tone is very different, you'll see a similar pattern to the Spectator, where they'll get the odd right winger in, you know, to to keep the people happy. So you'll have the odd Rod Little, the odd Nigel Farage, but basically the House view will be very establishment, uh, probably very supportive of, of Boris Johnson and the modern Conservative Party. And I think again, you know, in Britain in the 21st century especially with the plurality of media we have the potential of having. Um, conservatives and the right and patriots and Brexiteers deserve their own proper channel that is run by genuine conservatives and Brexiteers and funded by genuine conservatives and Brexiteers. Uh, and, I, and I don't think GB News is that. I think it's, it's, it's just you know, slightly better than the BBC. And I think we can do a lot better than that. And, and I think the problem with that, and we've already seen it, is that as with the Conservative Party, you get something that is that is basically left wing, that is progressive, that is globalist, um, is liberal, but it's a bit less progressive, globalist and liberal than the alternative. Um, so that then becomes declared far right, which <laughs> been used, think, has been. Shut it down. Right. So, so that then becomes the extreme. And that's the Overton window then that 
um, you know, Boris Johnson is, and, and Andrew Neil are as far right as you can go. Um, and therefore any views, any views that would be genuinely conservative are just beyond the pale and, and, and outrageous and extremist. Um, that's not a reflection of the country, I think. Um, I think most of the country would find a lot of the people uh, on GB News to be to their left. Uh, and so I say, why can't we have, uh, as I say, a, a proper conservative channel? The, one of the problems is the broadcast media laws in the UK that officially uh, say that you can't have any political bias in, in broadcast media that you produce. Um, again, I think that is a rule that needs to go but it also doesn't cover the internet. And so I think there's, there's huge potential. Uh, I mean, for God's sake, there are, there are, there are channels with millions of viewers on YouTube that, that are dedicated to a certain strategy on Minecraft. So surely, <laughs> surely we can have a channel that genuinely represents conservatives and Brexiteers, which, which constitutes millions of people in Britain and the world. So I think that's the aspiration that, you know, don't, don't fall for, um, don't fall for the for the corporate guys um, that that you know tells you that um, GB News is the best you can do. Um, I think we can do a lot better, and I think if we do, and you look at a lot of the the operations in talk radio and plurality of media that they have in the United States, I see no reason why we can't replicate that in the UK, and I think that would be um, a major shot in the arm. The democracy and, and giving a proper voice to the people that is not just controlled by the same chumocracy uh, from from central London that pops on different hats when it suits them. Mm-hmm. And uh, one the final uh, uh, um, anecdote I want to go before I finish this off is um uh, Robert Aitken who I'm going to have on uh, in the next show is a uh, one of the next shows actually said that he Andrew Neil's a social liberal according to him so make of that what you will pretty much. And uh, well, there's no question. There's no question. He's a social liberal. I mean, if you if you um, if you go back and, and look at an interview he did with uh, Ben Shapiro on abortion, where he called oh, yeah. uh, Shapiro's views on abortion medieval. Um, I mean, they are simply the Christian view on abortion and uh, very mainstream in the United States. Um, yeah, as I say, uh, you, you you look at a guy like Andrew Neil's CV and you know the Economist. The, the Sunday Times, the Spectator, uh, these are these are neoliberal institutions, unquestionably. And uh, the penultimate question I wanted to ask you is that this is the title of the show, so I ask all my guests this: What would your ideal world be? Um, I, I think uh, one of the criticisms often levelled at conservatives is that um, you know you're you're sort of harking back to the past. Um, that world is gone, it's never coming back, and you need to sort of get with the, with the modern agenda. But that assumes, and I think a lot of the progressive agenda and liberalism, and indeed Marxism, assumes an inevitability, a linear inevitability of history, that you know, things keep getting more and more liberal, more and more progressive, more and more globalist. And I think if you actually study history, you see a much more cyclical, approach where you know you can go back and look at the debauchery of the Roman Empire and and see what was in effect a very socially liberal society and then you can look at the piousness of Victorian England which came several thousand years later and and see that things do not you know always move in the direction towards ever greater liberalism and when I I'm, I'm a student of international relations and the two competing texts when when I was studying were, were, were Fukuyama's end of history mm. that theorized that uh, that liberal democracy was the end point of human civilization and everyone was agreed on it and it was merely a matter of time before everyone adopted it and Huntington's clash of civilizations that said that um, essentially the liberal era was an anomaly and we will soon return to uh, global competition and uh, culture clashes and uh, the the pursuit of identity and separate identity um, by nationhood or, or community from the rest of the world and and 
my belief was always that the hunting was right and and <laughs> in the years since i left university the events that have occurred i think um almost couldn't more perfectly underwrite that you know i think the reason why brexit and trump were so upsetting to liberals is that they were told that these things were impossible these things were a thing of the past mm. and uh you know they would not be occurring in the future i remember I, I went to university in strasbourg and one of my colleagues went on to the european school in bruges which was a which is a, a feeder school if you want to go and work in the european commission and the eu institutions and i observed some of their lectures and and you know they were being taught that uh nation state is a thing of the past um that uh, there wouldn't be any wars in the future because you know, everyone was based in agreement and i just thought yeah this is absolute nonsense don't want um, to imagine right right and i think um i think you're still seeing that you're still seeing the eu pushing towards that you know, it's very interesting what's going on at the moment the sort of debate between the eu centrality and countries like hungary and, and the visegrad nations they are still advancing towards their super states and their and their borderless vision for the world um but i think increasingly you are seeing huge natural visceral opposition to it in the in the people um which you know brexit was of course so far the biggest emblem of but i think there will be many more in the future so to go back to your question of my vision for society i think um roger scruton mm who uh, I wish we'd have more time to talk about, but you know, was a patron of the Bow Group and I think one of the greatest conservative philosophers of all time, um, certainly the greatest conservative philosopher of, of, of our lifetimes. Um, he put forward the idea that conservatism is not merely a reactionary thing, it is a fixed point in that we've had enough human history now to learn what works and what doesn't. And so conservatism, um sets forth an idea that those lessons of what made society greatest are there for all to see and they have been very hard to create but are very easy to destroy um, and our focus should be on maintaining those those pillars of society that have given us um everything that certainly in britain and, and much of the west we have enjoyed and benefited so much from so we should battle to hold on to those traditional values and, and our identity and our nationhood and our culture and i think um a, an ideal society is simply one that that recognizes those lessons for history from history and stops trying to tear down um what we are um and what we were and uh, you know builds a society around those those core pillars Mm-hmm. And uh, before I ask the final question, one thing I want to know is that the guy who wrote The End of History, I don't want to butcher the name, so I'm not going to try and pronounce it. Uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, in 2014, admitted that his views were too, very idealistic and simplistic at the time, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. in the I can't remember where it was. I think it might be National Review or something, So, well, which is very honest. interesting. Yeah, you're, you're right about that. And uh, what was so interesting about that is that, um, you know, if, if you if you engage with philosophers or the academics of old i mean academics of now are uh, just sort of notes of the orthodoxy but but anyone who is a proper academic or, or a proper philosopher i think will be certain about almost nothing you know they will be open to the idea that they might be wrong and whilst they will passionately argue for their views they will often caveat them by saying but, but you know who really knows um and what was interesting about the, the, the Fukuyama climb down is that um, his ideas had so imbued the Western establishment that whilst he himself said that I think I was wrong about this, the establishment just carried on with it. Mm. Um, the, even though the, the, the sort of the godfather of those ideas, he's not, he's not, I mean, he's not the only thinker that, that contributed to that worldview, but, but I think he is the one that best distilled that notion that liberal progressive democracy is inevitable um whilst he himself has now said that uh, i was wrong and huntingdon was right um there are the majority of the establishment still sort of banging the fukuyama drum against his will mm-hmm. uh, which i think 
tells you a lot about the uh, again, as I say, the the, the intellectual um, acuity of, of the people. Thank you for coming on, by the way. If um, people wanted to find your work or the Bow Group's work, how can they find that? Like, what social media links do you have? Just spill, yeah, yeah, spill so the beans. You, 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 can, you can follow the Bow Group at Bow Group, B-O-W Group on, on Twitter. Um, that's where we are most active. Um, we have Facebook page as well. I am on Twitter as at B underscore HQ. Uh, you can go to the, the Bow Group website at uh, bowgroup.org and uh, we regularly appear in all good news media outlets. Mm -hmm. Thank you for coming on and uh, have a great night. You too. It's Thank been you. a pleasure. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this podcast, please like and share this video, as well as subscribe to the Edward Ed Interviews YouTube channel and also the Ed Interviews BitChute channel. And also look at my stuff on Mixcloud as well. I have more of this content coming in. And also subscribe to my Patreon subscribe store as well for more guests, requests, as well as free copies of my old books. Until then, see you next time, guys.